All right, and the question is, where does this recording go? Because the YouTube Live uh, automatically uploads to my YouTube channel. I don't know. Um, or share your screen with them. That sounds like an exciting thing that I've never done. So someone is having problems opening the Word documents that I sent, and I will, I will um, share them on the screen uh, as soon as I understand how to do that. Share screen. Let me try it. It looks interesting. Basic advanced files. No, I'm not ready to do that yet. I'll, I'll figure it out because it's from Dropbox and uh, and Google Drive, and I don't I don't I don't have those connected to this computer. So I'll um, I'll uh, I'll do that in the break and uh, and figure out how how to get started. Okay, so nobody objected to starting. We have to leave in plenty of time to hear what the Prime Minister has to say tonight at 8 p.m. Hopefully it's not another demonetization. Um, yesterday I began talking about the importance of the preamble in terms uh, not only of its legal and constitutional uh, history, which has, has been fairly turbulent with ups and downs uh, up until the point in the case of an, uh, uh, the, the uh, Bhakti case where uh, it was established as being an uh, integral part of the Constitution's basic structure. And, uh, and then the, the fate um, since that time, which is that it's more and more appealed to for um, not only characterizing the spirit of the Constitution, but even helping to determine what certain fundamental uh, uh, rights, freedoms, uh, um, what their scope uh, is. Now, uh, the reason I brought this up again today is that many of you must have seen in the news that a certain PJP Rajasthava member has uh, stated um, uh, to move a resolution for removal of the term socialism from the constitution. Now, uh, uh, even as little time as we spent yesterday discussing the nature of the um, preamble, what I call the anatomy of the preamble, you know that this, you ought to know that this would be removing it from the objectives part of the preamble. Uh, so to say something like to remove the word socialism from the Constitution implies many, many different things. Constitution itself, uh, the preamble, the objectives part of the preamble. And each of these has some sort of uh, organic relationship uh, with the other. But why I bring it up is because of the, the quotation. Now, I haven't I haven't read the original words of the Rajya Sabha member, so I'm just going off of a press uh, article, which is always very dangerous. So I'm, I'm saying this casually, not as some kind of declaration of the truth. But the, minister, the uh, Rajya Sabha member was quoted as saying that Dr. Ambedkar did not want the socialist uh, term to appear in the, in the preamble. And I, once again, find this very amusing because um, we can ask, well, why would it matter whether Dr. Ambedkar wanted the word socialism in the preamble? Um, this gets towards that notion of legislative intent that we had spoken about, and it gets towards the mystery of uh, authorship and the role of the drafters of the Constitution, or in this case, the preamble, and what they wanted, included, and not included. So what I want to raise to you is quite a fascinating um, uh, issue, fascinating topic. If the BJP Rajya Sabha member who wants to make a motion to remove the word socialism from, I assume he means the preamble, um, 
because Dr. Baker didn't want it, then does the converse also mean something? Does it mean something to say what Dr. Ambedkar wanted into the preamble is what we should be following in our preamble? So I hope you understand what I'm asking. If we say that we should remove a concept or a term from the preamble because Dr. Ambedkar didn't want it, does it also follow that we should show commitment to certain terms in the preamble because Dr. Ambedkar wanted them? And this is a very interesting uh, question to ask oneself, and we're going to, in, in a way, start to talk about what is it that certain constituent assembly members or drafting committee members wanted in the preamble, and why does it matter? So yesterday I had pointed out that if you look on Google, uh, Dr. Vitka's wants or what he doesn't want, with respect to the drafting of the preamble would seem to be insignificant because according to Google, to Wikipedia, to Quora, um, and elsewhere, in fact, I have found 23 websites, uh, some of them from the government of India, stating that um, either Nehru or Rao is the author of the preamble. Um, according to all of this misinformation or disinformation, um, Dr. Vitka had very little to do with the drafting of the uh, preamble. So why does it make, so why would a BJP Rajya Sabha member say, we will remove socialism because Dr. Ambedkar didn't want it? Is this in a climate of understanding that Dr. Ambedkar's role in the drafting of the preamble was central, unlike what Google and Wikipedia and the UPSC and all of the websites and Basu and everyone else says? Or rather, is it a, a cynical attempt to justify one's own interests by making an appeal to a leader of um, uh, many uh, marginalized communities? So um, if it's the latter, uh, it's quite odd because on the one hand, we know that lawyers and judges, such as ourselves, don't know the truth about the authorship of the preamble. It has to follow that ordinary citizens generally don't, although there are certain communities that have histories of recitation about the authorship. We're going to leave that aside for a minute. So what about politicians? If the leading law schools in the country don't have a sense of the authorship of the preamble, are we to assume that this Raja Sabha member uh, knows the inside story of how the preamble was drafted and what Dr. Baker did or did not want? It stretches credibility to believe that that's the case, which means that what we're seeing in this uh, press article from today is an interesting way of politically manipulating misunderstandings about the authorship of the preamble in order to produce a political uh, result. So uh, I bring this up because it's yet another reason why understanding the true nature and history of the preamble can determine in some ways how we ought to understand its present and its future. So, while I was trying to explain beyond understanding the importance of the preamble, we need to understand the nature of the preamble. And this is something that lawyers need to know, uh, because as we had talked about, uh, preambles have an anatomy. They have a basic, uh, I don't want to use the word basic structure. They have a, um, uh, a basic set of components that are used, and the drafters of constitutions and preambles always look around at existing constitutions. You're probably too young to remember the era of um, constitution making in Eastern uh, and Central Europe after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the Soviet Union. So each of these um, uh, former Soviet uh, uh, states, as well as each of the, um, the, the countries behind the so-called Iron Curtain, had to start drafting constitutions, um, which happened throughout the 1990s. And 
um, during the drafting of these constitutions, I was partly involved in the process in, uh, in Hungary um, in the drafting of constitutions like the new Hungarian constitution. What, uh, what the drafters did was to look at uh, the existing constitutions around the world. And for example, for Hungary, the German constitution was a major uh, model. So every constitution maker, every drafter looks around to see what is available in the existing constitutions, especially of those sorts of states that they wish to emulate. So if you're in the Organization of Islamic uh, Conference, OIC, uh, and you want to draft a new con uh, constitution, obviously it's going to be um, important to you to look at those 40 odd uh, existing states in the OIC and try to find elements from those constitutions that um, would be suitable for you to use. And just the same in the 1940s, the um, constitutional advisor BM Rao, as well as members of the uh, Congress party and several other parties as we're going to find out, were, were, were fairly robustly engaged with examining the constitution, especially of uh, constitutional democracies around the world in order to grab components that would be useful. In this basket of parts of preambles of democratic constitutions around the world, you have the declaratory objectives, descriptive and invocative parts to choose from. And I have mentioned that the declaratory, declaratory part, I don't know why I find that word so difficult to pronounce, declaratory part uh, tells us who framed the constitution and with what mandate and our declaratory part, which is very moving, is uh, we the people of India, and then of course in our constituent assembly. So who framed it and with what mandate? And the objectives part tells us why the document was framed, what, what its goals are. Um, so the, uh, the framing of this document pursues a kind of objective. And our objective is that we are resolved to constitute India into a sovereign democratic republic. These are the goals, our goals at the constituent assembly that we the people are going to uh, um, form constitute India into a, a, a sovereign democratic republic. Um, why these three terms, sovereign democratic republic, I had mentioned the constituent assembly is full of debates on this, very, very lively and uh, compelling debates. One thing you can do is look at the 4th of November in 1948 speech of Dr. Ambedkar to the constituent assembly in order to understand why these three terms were chosen. Um, in the objectives part of the constitution. Now, I assume the BJP uh, Rajya Sabha member today who said that Dr. Ambedkar did not want the word socialism in the, uh, uh, well, he says constitution, but now being more technical, in the objectives part of the preamble to the constitution. I assume this Rajya Sabha member has read the 4th November 1948 uh, speech and is inferring from that speech, although Dr. Amitra doesn't use the term socialist in that speech. Um, oh, I just got a note from Zoom saying, running out of time, we've removed the 40 minute time limit on your meeting. So that simplifies things, unless you thought that you're gonna be able to run off and, and uh, have a break. We will have a break. So maybe this Rajya Sabha member read the 4th November 1948 speech. I want you to read it. It explains why these terms were used. Sovereign Democratic Republic. And the Constituent Assembly debates are full of the debates about them. But we're not going to focus on the objectives part, nor are we going to focus on the declaratory part. And now we're up to speed with what I had covered yesterday, because there are two other anatomical parts of any preamble in constitutional democracies. And the important one that we're going to talk about is the descriptive part. So now we've entered into the third part of the uh, uh, preamble. What is the function of a descriptive part? It says how those objectives from the objectives part are going to be realized, because there are innumerable ways to realize the objectives of a sovereign democratic republic. So, if that is our objective, 
don't see the idea as a sovereign democratic republic, what are the means through which we are going to achieve that objective? And that is the descriptive party. It tells you the basic principles of the preamble, which infuse the basic spirit of the Constitution itself. And our descriptive part runs to secure, you probably know it, right? Uh, justice, let me... Um, let's see if this can come up. Now I know Zoom allows me to, sh to bring things into the screen. I haven't learned to do that yet. I will learn during the break, but um, probably you're not able to. Uh, are you able to see that? I don't think you're able to see it, but I assume you're quite familiar with the, with the uh, constitution. So the, uh, the preamble. So the descriptive part runs, to secure to all its citizens justice, social, economic, and political, liberty of thought, expression, belief, faith, and worship, equality of status and of opportunity, and to promote among them all fraternity, assuring the dignity of the individual and the unity of the nation. So, uh, there are two things that I want to mention here. One is that that should have sounded a little off to you because this is the original preamble, uh, 26 Jan 1950, prior to the amended post-1976 amended preamble. So let's uh, look once again at the descriptive part of the preamble. The descriptive part of the preamble consists of a mere 44 words, that's it. To secure to all its citizens justice, Uh, social, economic, and political, liberty of thought, expression, belief, faith, and worship, equality of status and of opportunity, and to promote among them all fraternity assuring the dignity of the individual and the unity of the nation. So this is from the descriptive part. Of the original preamble. Now, I, I moved dignity and nation aside uh, uh, a little bit because they were they're inside the fraternity clause. So the fraternity clause is very significant in terms of the descriptive part of the preamble because it consists of very, very heavy concepts. Concepts like justice are very um, uh, heavy. Justice, liberty, equality, fraternity, and dignity and nation are concepts equally heavy. Um, and they occur within the fraternity clause. So, for example, equality of status and of opportunity. Status and opportunity are two kinds of equality. We're going to talk about that from among many other alternatives and supplementary notions that were available to the draft people of the, of the preamble. Um, but they selected only status and opportunity, and we have to understand uh, why. So there, there's the descriptive part of the, um, of, the, uh, of the preamble, which tells us the basic principles, not only of the Constitution, but as I mentioned, preambles appear before many different kinds of instruments. So they can be uh, charters, they can be bills, and of course the Constitution like we're talking about, what the of the descriptive part of a preamble to anything like a charter or a bill, um, and especially the Constitution does, is it tells you the basic principles of this, of this um, uh, document. So what I'm suggesting to you is that if you understand the nature of preambles and their anatomical parts, 
and how these parts function together, you can start to realize which concepts are very central and crucial to this infusing the overall spirit of the document that it is the preamble to, in this case, the Constitution. Or in other words, justice, liberty, equality, fraternity, dignity, and nation are very heavy and central concepts breathing life into the spirit of the Indian Constitution. Now, that's descriptive is just the third part of um, anatomical part of a preamble. There's another part which is invocative. And I had mentioned already the declaratory and the objective, which we had discussed yesterday. So I've read to you just now the descriptive part. I read to you yesterday the declaratory part. It's very short. We, the people of India, in our constituent assembly, dated this 26 November with him. Um, and of course, I had mentioned why 26 November instead of 26 January. We'll take that up uh, next session. Um, and uh, the objectives part was all to constitute India and the sovereign democratic republic. So I've read to you the declaratory part, the objectives part, the descriptive part. Now it's time to read to you the invocative part of the preamble. So what is the invocative part of the preamble? Anyone wants to jump in? Um, you can unmute and, uh, and tell me the invocative part of the preamble. We the people of India? No, that's the declaratory part. Okay, I was slightly confused between the two actually. Yeah, it's very confusing. I mean, this is not something that uh, anyone normally learns, right? I'm sure this is the first time that you're hearing that uh, preambles have uh, fixed structures. Now, when I say fixed, I don't mean they have to always be in this order, or they have to include all of these parts, or they have to say anything in particular. What I'm suggesting to you is, like the example of constitution making in the 1990s, the example of constitution making in the post-colonial world, so after British, French, uh, and, 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 and these imperial countries started to decolonize the world, all of these phases of constitution making didn't just, I mean, they didn't just hire someone like you or me to sit in a room and start writing whatever they wanted. It required a great deal of study of the existing constitutions, of the existing states or bodies that reflected the ideals or the orientation that you wanted. So for example, I mentioned the OIC countries. If you are in an OIC country, you are probably going to have an invocative part which says something like, by the grace or by the blessings of Allah. This is probably going to appear in OIC countries in the invocative part of the preamble. Because you, this is what we look at. So when we looked at different constitutional democracy preambles in order to draft the preamble to the Indian constitution, there were several available, including the Turkish one, and um, two of the Tur other Turks' uh, uh, secular constitutions. And, um, uh, and we picked up uh, pieces that we uh, that we found uh, reflected our objectives, reflected our aims. So what is our invocative part? Adopt and act and give. Uh, that is still part of the declaratory um, um, because we give to ourselves in the constituent assembly. So we the people adopt and act and give 
to ourselves. And that's very important. Why is that important? Because the British, very in their very um, uh, polite way, offered to give us a constitution. Here, we've written one, have it. It's our gift to you. We don't want such a constitution, right? We want to adopt, we want to enact, and we want to give to ourselves this constitution. And this is all part of who framed it and with what mandate. The mandate is we are a free and independent, sovereign, democratic state and we republic, and we will adopt an act and give to ourselves a constitution. So these words are still in our constituent assembly. Okay, I think I've sent you off on a wild goose chase. Do you remember when I had asked you, um, by the way, I'm reading comments that you're, you're giving. I guess you could all read them so you know why I keep randomly saying things like in our constituents. Okay. So uh, yesterday I asked you to Google who wrote the preamble to the Constitution of India, and you got all the Nehru and maybe Bien Rao and stuff like that. Today I'm asking you, what is the invocative part of the preamble? I think you're going to notice that maybe this is a trend with me. I send you on these hunts to find out that we've got sort of wrong in information. And here it comes. The preamble to the Indian Constitution does not have an invocatory part. Now that's not a meaningless thing. It is a very, very important thing when you take into consideration, oh no, my internet connection is unstable. Let me, tell you. Let me just check on that. Oh, now should be the good time that I would close the video, right? I need to learn that. I'm gonna learn that in the break. In the break, I'll learn how to shut the video without shutting the recording and how to share a document on the screen. Okay, we don't have an invocatory part. This is not an insignificant thing. This is a hugely significant thing because what we're going to find out is that, okay, let, let, let me take a, a small parenthetical uh, detour because you're a law student. You know that if a law leaves something out, that that is as meaningful as the words that the law uh, includes. So for example, we have no fundamental right to privacy in the uh, listed fundamental freedoms. So the court is left to do what? The court is left to either read it in to an article like Article 21 through different means, or on the contrary, can opt to say, that, that's alien, that's an alien freedom to our constitution. And consequently, it's not a freedom that we have. So, so the absence of a term gives you uh, uh, the opportunity either to find it elsewhere in the document, in spirit, since you can't find it in letter, or on the other hand, to say that, so we don't have one. Now, how does it function in our preamble? Unmute. Am I audible? Yes, okay. Now, um, um, I don't know when I stopped being audible, and I don't know if I'm still recording. Recording. Yeah, it looks like it's recording. Looks like the participants are there. So I think we're go, I can carry on. I can, let me turn this video off. I'm going to press stop video and hope that it doesn't stop recording. Yes, it seems to be recording and you could maybe turn off the camera and switch to just audio. Yeah, I've done that. 
All right, are you with me? It's still lagging significantly. It shouldn't lag now that I'm just on audio. Yes, sir, but we missed the entire last bit. All right. So um, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to just back up to and say it a little faster. I sent you on a kind of wild goose chase to find the involuntary part of the preamble to the Indian Constitution, because unlike many, 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 if not most constitutions, um, and certainly all of them in the OIC and Catholic countries, and, and uh, so it might be in, um, for example, uh, uh, Protestant or uh, more hardcore socialist countries where you don't have an involuntary part. Um, Unlike many, many countries, our preamble does not have an invocation. Now, what does an invocatory part do? As I mentioned, each of these parts of a preamble have a certain function. The objectives part, why the document is framed, what its goals are, the descriptive part, how we're going to achieve those objectives, and giving the basic principles and so on. So what's the invocative part? It, in a way, tells you, it invokes some kind of higher power, some kind of um, authority, or some sort of, um, uh, yeah, this is, uh, someone has just mentioned, uh, a legitimizing instrument. So it's interesting because we have to, we have to separate legitimacy from sovereignty. Um, the invocatory part doesn't necessarily give you the source of sovereignty, because the source of sovereignty is basically given by the declaratory part, which tells you the mandate. But the it does give you a legitimization because that mandate, let's say, if it's we, the people of India, is not done so in a way of disrespecting how we, the people of India, appeared on the earth in the first place. Or, you know, uh, for example, many Catholic countries have a creation myth or a creation belief that um, that uh, uh, God first created a you know a, a man and then uh, you all know the story so there's no point in getting into it so the, the source of sovereignty ultimately while it rests with the people is in some way a gift or bestowed by a divine power now the Islamic countries, the OIC countries, almost all begin with an invocation to Allah as the source of sovereignty, which humans hold temporarily while on earth. The Indian constitution has no invocatory part, and that doesn't just mean nothing, it means something very significant. It means that, as one of you had said in the first place in the chat, we the people takes on a new kind of significance in the preamble to the Indian constitution because there were alternatives widely available in democratic constitutions and those alternatives were to appeal to God or to gods or there's a funny debate in the constituent assembly that uh, some of you may know uh, goddesses as opposed to gods in fact this was the debate on whether we should have an invocation in the preamble Someone said, yes, I'll read you his proposed amendment to the preamble. And then the reply, which came from a, um, a, a, a constituent assembly member with a nice sense of humor said, why should we appeal to God and, and why not to a goddess? So um, there was the option to have an invocation. And I'm going to read to you what Shivanlal Saxena, constituent assemblyman, had proposed to Dr. Ambedkar as a revision of the preamble that was introduced into the constituent assembly on 4th November 1948. So Saxena says, he makes a motion that for the preamble, the following be substituted, quote, in the name of God the Almighty, that's how invocations begin. In the name of God the Almighty, under whose inspiration and guidance the father of our nation, Mahatma Gandhi, led the nation from slavery into freedom. 
um, there was another uh, um, suggested amendment to the preamble by uh, Pandit Govind Malia, which I quote, by the grace of Parameshwar, the Supreme Being, the Lord of the universe, called by different names by different people of the world, we, the people of India, so on and so forth. Uh, by not having an invocative part, are we suggesting separation of state and religion? If so, why we didn't adopt the Western concept of secularism? Okay, very interesting. So, uh, yes, uh, Shiva, uh, that's precisely what's going on here. By refusing an invocative part, we were already indicating the nature of secularism in the uh, in the Constitution. So the uh, uh, We'll, we'll speak separately about using the term secularism, but there's a very simple and straightforward answer that I can give you, free of all of the rhetoric and politics that we find in the public uh, sphere and in the press and in um, arguments and so on, which is, as I've stated many times, when we are drafting a constitution, we look at what is available in the constitutions of the model countries, the kind of countries that we would like India to be like, or Hungary, or uh, you know, uh, Kazakhstan, or whatever these new countries that were being created uh, after decolonization or after the fall of the Soviet Union and so on. We look at what is available in the states um, uh, that we aspire to be like in some ways. And here's what I propose to you in a very mundane way there was not a single constitution in the 1940s available to the drafting uh, uh, committee members which used the word secularism in its preamble. Now, I've said this to many people, like uh, to Ashish Nandi and to Nira Chandok and to Rajiv Bhargav and others who write routinely on uh, secularism and debate secularism. And they find this rather astonishing and surprising. Of course, everybody points to Ataturk and his secularization of Turkey. But um, in the second constitution that, uh, of um, Ataturk's uh, Turkey, the idea of invoking Allah, which all the organization of Islamic uh, uh, countries do, um, uh, this is scratched out. So the second Turkish uh, constitution of Ataturk does indeed have uh, secularism introduced, but it is not in the preamble. That was in the 1920s, I believe in 1924. You can correct me, anyone who studies comparative constitutions. Um, so uh, basically what we see by choosing not to have an invocation is an articulation, a very, a very fundamental articulation of the secular nature of the Indian constitution done so in an active choice of leaving something out, as opposed to in the choice of writing something in. Now, this is uh, a little too subtle or sophisticated for common people who are not uh, lawyers or who are not familiar with how legislation is drafted and so on, um, to, uh, to really pay much attention to. But for you, I want you to notice that if Preambles have certain essential features, and our drafting committee members chose to leave out an invocation. It has a significant meaning. Now, moving beyond that, I want to mention that the first, um, the first time that the Constituent Assembly met in order to discuss the draft constitution, that the drafting committee chairperson had introduced to the, um, to the Constituent Assembly. The very first meeting, the president of the Constituent Assembly, Rajin Prasad, uh, asked everyone present to stand and repeat an oath. Have you heard about this? Do you know that our very first Constituent Assembly meeting to scrutinize the draft constitution uh, was uh, began with everyone rising to say an oath? Is this something you have ever learned? So that oath that everybody rose 
to say, I'll tell it to you on another time, it began with um, uh, 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 how do you call it, not praise, a uh, invocation of, uh, of Mahatma Gandhi. And, the, and, and, and to the, the words from that invocation was to thank Mahatma Gandhi, the father of our nation, who led us from slavery into freedom. So in other words, the Constituent Assembly actually met and rose and was asked by the president to repeat a, an oath or a, uh, I guess a, they called it a solemn vow in uh, thanks to Mahatma Gandhi. So what, why Shivanlal Saxena makes a motion in the Constituent Assembly to replace the original preamble that has no invocation with a preamble that states in the name of God the Almighty under whose inspiration and guidance the father of our nation Mahatma Gandhi led the nation from, sleep, from slavery into freedom. Why uh, Saxena, Malvia and others said our constitution needs to have an invocatory part has basically two components. One is a sense of pushing back against the drafting committee's notion that our preamble needs to be fundamentally secular. And two, pushing back against the um, perceived anti-Gandhian um, uh, orientation of uh, one person in particular, the chairperson of the drafting committee. And I think this is quite fascinating historically because what we're going to learn is that in the first reading of the constitution, I hope you're, you probably, I'm just gonna assume that you don't know these things instead of continuing to ask you if you know about these things. So in the first, so if I say things that you already know or that are um, uh, common knowledge for you, please forgive me because I keep asking you as though I'm standing in front of you in a classroom, whether you know things or not, so I know whether to skip or to continue. But since I can't get any feedback from you, I don't want to skip important things just in case you might not know them. So the first reading of the Constitution began um, on 4th November, 1948. And this was the day that the uh, assembly was asked to rise and recite this oath to Mahatma Gandhi. And this started the first week of scrutiny of the Constitution, especially the preamble, and that scrutiny was not only against the wording of the preamble, it was equally against the persons who drafted it, and uh, very specifically, uh, Dr. Ambedkar. So the first week, as we're going to learn more about, was, was filled with a kind of um, insurrection amongst the assembly members asking why this preamble, this constitution, has nothing Gandhi um, uh, in it. And Dr. Baker is forced to reply uh, to this accusation, which he does not only on 4th November 1948, but also on 25th November 1949, as we'll discuss. That's the other speech that I had asked you to read. Um, he says, in fact, that we can separate what is referred to as elements of ancient Indian polity, which people assume is what Gandhi was championing. We can, we can separate what Gandhi is championing from ancient Indian polity, because by the 25th November 1949, Dr. Ambedkar has had a year to think about this charge that the preamble and the constitution has nothing um, authentically or ancient uh, Indian about it. And in the process of that year, he, uh, he manages to, uh, to reconceive the answer that he gives to the Constituent Assembly in terms of the way that elements of ancient Indian polity reappear in the Constitution and quite uh, uh, drastically, let's say, in the preamble itself. But we'll talk about that um, uh, when we start to talk about fraternity. So let me just summarize then. Uh, someone asked me to repeat the second point. Let me summarize or repeat the two points. 
<laughs> All right. So what I was suggesting to you is that not having an invocation um, uh, created a kind of uh, uh, disruption during the first reading of the uh, Constitution and the preamble. The first reading started on 4th November, and in that week, they were talking basically about principles of the Constitution. And this was a good time to start to argue about whether we should have ancient Indian quality, whether we should tip our hat to Mahatma Gandhi. And as I had mentioned, the assembly was forced or requested to rise and recite a vow to Gandhi. And people wanted the, the words from that vow to appear in the preamble itself. So by choosing not to have an invocation, the drafting committee opened itself up to two kinds of attacks. These were the two things that I was saying. On the one hand, the kind of attack that the drafting committee has proposed of a, a profoundly secular uh, document since they refuse to invoke uh, God or, for example, what uh, Pandit Malviya's uh, suggestion was, by the grace of Parameshwar, the Supreme Being, the Lord of the Universe, called by different names by different people. So by refusing to do this, the drafting committee opened itself up to the charge of being, uh, of, 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 of drafting a very secular uh, uh, preamble, which indeed was their aim. And the second was a personal uh, uh, kind of accusation against Dr. Baker that he was refusing to bring in any kind of Gandhian elements into this constitution. So um, uh, Dr. Baker responds both on 4th November and on 25th November the next year about the, the elements brought in of ancient Indian polity. All right, quick rundown. We have four basic parts of a preamble. Common people can say whatever they want. All right, people uh, uh, in the newspapers, people on the streets, people in your households and whatever can just talk about a preamble and what a preamble means. But those of us who are engaged in the business of writing preambles or of interpreting preambles or of even trying to get elements of the preamble to reflect on interpretations of fundamental rights or um, other aspects of the meaning of the Constitution itself. We need to know more clearly that preambles have basic parts and each of these parts have different functions. And the parts that I've mentioned are the declaratory part, we the people of India, so on and so forth, in our constitution, a uh, constituent assembly do give ourselves this constitution. It has an objectives part, why the document is framed, resolved to constitute India into a sovereign democratic republic. So I had mentioned on day one, that this objectives part, this use of the term objectives, confuses people into thinking that since Nehru wrote the objectives resolution, which by the way, he did not, but I'll discuss that later, since Nehru wrote the objectives resolution, and the objectives are what the preamble aims to articulate, therefore it follows that Nehru wrote the preamble to the Constitution, which as I had mentioned, he did not. Now, in addition to the objectives part, there is the descriptive part, which I've been talking about primarily today, and I wrote these concepts on the board, justice, liberty, equality, fraternity, dignity, and nation, because in the descriptive part, you are explained how the objectives are going to be realized, and you are given the basic principles of, let's say, the act, the legislation, the bill, or the charter, or in this case, the constitution the basic principles that infuse, inspire, that characterize what the document that follows the preamble is supposed to mean, why, and how it's to be realized. And then you have an invocative part. And the curious thing about the Indian Constitution is that it refuses to have an invocative part. It doesn't just not have one, it consciously doesn't have one because there were innumerable members of the Constituent Assembly constantly saying during the first reading of the draft constitution, we must have an invocation. And this invocation had two basic prongs to it. One, an invocation to God, or Parameshwar, 
or um, the Lord of the universe or God the Almighty. He's, I'm quoting all of the proposals for an invocation from the Constituent Assembly transcripts. One, that it should have an appeal to God like Islamic countries normally do, like Catholic countries normally do, the Indian state should also have an appeal uh, to God. This was categorically rejected by Dr. Ambedkar and other members of the drafting committee in the constituent assembly. On the other side, that there was no mention of Mahatma Gandhi in the preamble because the invocation part of a preamble is the perfect place to make mention of Mahatma Gandhi, and the words were already written. Um, uh, we thank the father of our nation, Mahatma Gandhi, who led the nation from slavery into freedom. These words were already written and available and more or less forced upon the drafting committee by the way that President Rajendra Prasad, President of the Constituent Assembly, asked everyone to rise and repeat this expression. So in the first reading, the first week of debates about the basic principles of the Constitution and the preamble, everybody wanted an invocation, and that invocation was either to God, but the drafting committee wanted to keep the document secular, or to Gandhi, but Dr. Ambedkar wanted to keep the, um, uh, the Constitution, in some ways, Gandhi-free. Now, uh, this is the background of the different parts of the preamble, what I call it the anatomy of the preamble. There are other anatomical parts to a preamble, which I'm not going to mention. Those weren't uh, included and they weren't even uh, discussed um, by the drafting committee. The original preamble, which was submitted to um, the president of the Constituent Assembly for uh, to be published and to be uh, scrutinized by the general public and especially by members of government and so on. Um, that was 81 words. The original preamble was 81 words. Post-1976 amendment, the current preamble is 85 words. If the Rajya Sabha member <laughs> who today is saying that he's going to make a motion to remove socialism from the constitution, which I'm saying I believe he means the objectives part of the preamble, then we might have 84 words in our preamble. However that be, out of the original 81 words, the descriptive part, which gives the basic principles of the preamble, is only 44 words. And out of those 44 words, I'm going to focus with you this week on only six of them. And those are the six that I wrote on the whiteboard, justice, liberty, equality, fraternity, dignity, and nation. These are the six central principles of the descriptive part, which explains how the objective part, how India is going to be realized as a sovereign democratic republic. These are the basic principles according to which we realize India as a sovereign democratic republic. So these six concepts, I call them heavy concepts, these are the weight, the gravity of our preamble lies in these six concepts. And one doesn't know that unless one understands the anatomy of a preamble. I hope you understand that. We've gone on for more than an hour now, so maybe it's time for a break. Before I move into a break, I'll just tell you a little joke. Um, I was giving a talk at... Uh, Right now I'm in Delhi, I teach sometimes at JNU, I used to, um, and this term I'm teaching in Jindal. Um, uh, when I was at JNU, I was giving a talk to the uh, uh, center, uh, it's called CSSS, I've forgotten what all the S's stand for, but it's uh, basically the sociology center. I'm giving a talk on a new book that I'm working on, on, um, on cognitive, uh, Empathy, it's not important for you, <laughs> to understand, but basically legal reasoning and so on. And uh, uh, one uh, uh, professor in the audience raised his hand and he says, uh, 
Akash, you're assuming that people have organs. Right? And, and I was just absolutely baffled. I had no idea what he was talking about. He said, you, I said, what, what do you mean? He said, you assume that people have organs. And I said, yes, why would I not assume that we have organs uh, like a liver or kidney, things like that. And he said, no, I reject the idea that people have organs. <laughs> so anyway, um, maybe you can have a view like this. I still don't understand what on earth he's talking about. Or he, you know, he, he said I was too fixated on the brain when I was talking about these, you know, uh, uh, the relationship of cognitive rationality and legal reasoning and so on. But anyway, you can assume something like there are no organs or there's no anatomy at all. But essentially, people like us in the legal profession need to realize that in the drafting of legislation, there are crucial components. And depending upon how these components are framed or phrased, a great deal of uh, consequences interpretatively follow. So we cannot confuse the descriptive part with the objectives part. We cannot confuse the objectives part with the declaratory part. People like us in the legal profession, although common people will always talk about, for example, um, including secularism or socialism as a fundamental principle to the constitution. So more accurately stated, secularism and socialism post 1976 amendment are fundamental to the objectives part of the preamble to the constitution. And while it gets dangerous to speak about these issues in a glib manner without understanding properly the background, I want you to know at least that preambles have these basic anatomical parts whether you believe in organs or not, they have these basic anatomical parts and these anatomical parts make fundamental difference to interpreting the nature of the preamble itself. We're going to focus on the descriptive part then because those are the basic principles and we are going to um, have to keep in mind what we learned from the invocative part, which is that what is left out is just as important as what is included in. Now after the break, I'm going to go back to the common narratives about the authorship of the preamble, keeping in mind what I just said, that what is left out is as important as what uh, goes in. And then we are going to start um, unfolding the actual drafting process of the preamble to the constitution which has in some ways remained hidden from view in the 70, last 70 years of the Indian Republic. And I'll tell you why uh, it's remained hidden from view uh, when we come back. So I'm going to uh, pause or stop this uh, meeting um, for, uh, let's say 15 minutes. And, uh, and then we'll, um, and then I honestly don't know how we're going to come back, but uh, <laughs> let's assume that you do know how we're going to come back. Uh, uh, can anyone guide me in this? Do I just uh, press stop? Did I put you all to sleep? Can someone tell me if I press end meeting, are we going to be able to, to meet again in 15 minutes? Yes. Yes, when do we resume? So I have 537. We might have to restart. I think so if we click on the same link, I think you will have to send a different link. Okay, let's assume I could just mute for 15 minutes. Yeah, we're just as clueless. <laughs> okay. Um, then here's what I'll do. I'll mute and I will press uh, pause on the recording. And then I will see you all in, um, in 15 minutes. All right, thank you very much. Oh, in the meantime, you can send some questions. Oh, but wait, what am I waiting for? Won't the meeting end anyway? Yes, actually, uh, Ritwik makes a good point. In case we get disconnected or it gets cut off, 
The first thing we're going to try to do is join again on the same link. If I'm sitting here all alone uh, 25 minutes from now because nothing is working, I'm going to assume that it, um, it uh, uh, the same link is not working, and I'm going to immediately start a new meeting and email you on that Google group and tweet the new uh, uh, joining link. Okay, so we have a backup plan. Uh, I'm muting for 15 minutes. In case it disconnects, try to join with the same link. In case that doesn't work, check your email or Twitter and you'll see a new link from me. Okay, I think that is uh, covers all of the the eventualities. So uh, enjoy yourself. I'll see you at um, at uh, six o'clock. Bye.